Hi, my name is Patrick Boyle. Welcome back to my YouTube channel where we learn all about derivatives and quantitative finance. In today's video, we're going to learn two methods for calculating VAR or value at risk. This video is part of a short series I'm doing on risk management in finance. If you click on my channel button and then on playlists, you'll see the playlist I put together collecting all of the videos on this topic. If this is the first video you're watching, make sure you click the subscribe button so that you can see more content like this going forward. By the end of this video, you're going to know how to calculate VAR by two different methods and the pros and cons of the two methods that we're covering. Okay, so there are two basic ways to calculate value at risk, the historical approach and the model approach. Using the historical approach, we look at the historical time series of a portfolio's return, and then we take the bottom x percentile. Microsoft Excel does this with the formula equals percent, and then you put in the array of returns that you're looking at, comma 5%, to calculate 95 VAR. Using the model approach, we look at the expected standard deviation of the portfolio and use the normal distribution tables to find the x percentile. So anyhow, let's go into each of those in a little bit of more detail. So the historical approach. To quickly understand VAR, what we'll do is we'll use an example that I worked through in my book, Trading and Pricing Financial Derivatives, which is linked to in the description below and we'll calculate the VAR on the returns of an equity mutual fund, Vanguard's VFAIX, which is based on the financials index. The last 15 years daily percentage returns can be seen on the screen right now. Daily returns are taken and put in order and converted into a histogram of daily returns. You can see that histogram on screen right now. In statistics, the 68-95-99 rule is shorthand to remember the percentage of values around the mean in a normal distribution with a width of 1, 2 and 3 standard deviations. More accurately, 68.27%, 95.45% and 99.73% of the values lie within 1, 2 and 3 standard deviations of the mean respectively. VAR assumes normally distributed returns, implying that 68% of the time we expect daily returns to fall between minus 1.8% and plus 1.8% for this index fund. Now that's actually surprisingly symmetrical. It's not always a plus or minus of the same number. In the worst 5% of days, this portfolio will lose 6.6% or more, as shown in the left tail of the histogram that you can see on screen right now. As you can also see, the worst one day return for this fund was a 9% loss and the biggest up day for the fund was a 12.6% gain. So that's data that you get from looking at past returns and of course then the question is how representative is the past of the expected future. So that's really all there is to the historic approach to calculating VAR. As you can see, all we did was download a representative sample of the daily returns and look for the 5% worst days. And that's really it. It's not very complicated. Now there are though a few things we should think about when looking at this data. When we look at the daily returns data, which you see on screen right now, you can see that the worst days in this example were not evenly spread throughout the 15 years of data, occurring once every 20 days, for example. You can instead see a lot of clustering, and I mentioned this idea in the last video. Often in the real world, we see the five or 10 worst days of the year occurring right next to each other. We'll talk more about this in my next video on time varying volatility. I know that a video with a title like that will be a huge hit here on YouTube, so I just had to make it. It's also worth noting that the 15 years of data that we used there included the credit crunch 2007 and 2008. Having that data in there will give you a good feel for what markets look like when they get quite wild. If instead you use this historic approach with only the five last years of data, you might be making the mistake of thinking that markets are a lot calmer than they actually are. VAR, like all of our financial models, suffers from the garbage in, garbage out problem. 
If you're a risk management professional, you really have to pay attention to how the models you are using work, when they're helpful and when they're useless. Anyhow, that was the historic approach. Let's next look at the model-based approach. With the model-based approach, instead of using historic data, we're going to use the standard deviation of the portfolio in question. If a portfolio standard deviation or sigma is expected to be one and a quarter percent, and we want to know it's one day 99 var, we use the normal distribution tables, which you can see on screen right now. The closest number we can find to 1% is 0.99%, and this is 2.33 standard deviations to the left of the mean. This means that the worst 1% of days we expect to have a 2.33 standard deviation loss. We assume that the expected daily return for the portfolio is around 0%, which is reasonable on daily returns on an equity index. Hence, 2.33 times the standard deviation of 1.25% gives us minus 2.91% as the 99 VAR. The worst 1% of days should thus involve losses of 2.91% or greater, according to this calculation. If we multiply this return by the size of the portfolio, we will get 99 VAR in dollar terms. For a $1 million portfolio, one would expect to lose $29,125 or more on the worst 1% of days in normal markets. So that's how the calculation is done. Now the more astute financial students out there may be asking where do we get the standard deviation from? We could of course just calculate the standard deviation from historic data, but that would be a historic standard deviation and what we're looking for here is some sort of forward-looking estimate of standard deviation, the likely standard deviation over the coming days and weeks. So if we're looking for a forward-looking or predicted standard deviation, where do we get that? Well, we could take it from implied volatility of the stocks in our portfolio. Now, if you don't know what implied volatility is, above is a link to my video explaining that idea. But it is a forward-looking estimate of volatility for a given underlying. As you can see, these two models are quite different from each other and will give you quite different numbers. So which one should you use? That's really up to you, but it might be worthwhile looking at both. As you can see with the model-based approach, when the market gets more volatile, implied volatility will rise, and without you making any changes to your portfolio, your VAR will change. There is a bit of a built-in assumption with this approach that the current level of volatility will be maintained in the market. In the next video, we'll look at the idea of time-varying volatility and how that might affect our approach to risk management. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you can be notified when each new video is released. I upload one new video each week. Hit the like button if you found this video helpful. All of these videos are based on my book. If you are interested, there's a link to that in the description below. Anyhow, see you later. Bye.